So good morning. So today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about real estate negotiations. This is the most fun part of my job. Uh, to be honest, this is kind of why I got into real estate because I absolutely love getting that win. Uh, so either if I'm working with a seller and I'm trying to drive up the price of their home or I'm working with a buyer and I'm trying to get them the best possible deal. Uh, this is something that keeps me super excited, something I'm very passionate about. So I wanted to uh, go over it with you guys. Uh, I think it's a really, really big topic that we probably should talk about a little bit more uh, because it's a huge part of our job. So we always want to make sure that we're conveying to our customer that we are a real estate negotiator. That is a huge value add for them because they don't want to do it themselves. So it's a topic that's probably not very comfortable for most people, kind of like talking about sales. You know, it's a scary kind of skill and strategy that some people are nervous. Are they good enough for it? Are they, are they good at this? So we want to make sure your skills are up as high as possible and you guys are comfortable and you know how to negotiate that best deal. So if you haven't read books on this, I would recommend, you know, The Art of the Deal by Donald Trump. Uh, there's some really fantastic books out there that you really want to get good at this and learn the best strategies possible so that you're helping get a win for your clients. So what does that mean? What does that mean? How to negotiate a real estate deal? Number one, you want to make sure you're creating a solution for all partners involved, right? So what we're trying to do, we know that we have a buyer, we have a seller, we have a listing agent in between the deal or a buyer's agent in between the deal. We have to make sure we're working all the angles for all of those partners to make sure that it's a solution for everybody involved. So it's not about taking advantage of somebody. It's not about, you know, winning, winning over somebody else. Nope, not at all. The whole concept of negotiation is creating a solution for everyone involved. Everyone feels good at the end of the day, right? You might've heard this. If you ever have tr trouble or problem with a customer, I'm like, give them a win. This is what people need. Be willing and able to walk away from the deal. This is number two skill. That's really, really hard to do. <laughs> so of course we work very hard for our customers. If you've been searching for houses, you've been working with a client for three, four, six months, and you find the right house for them. It's really, really scary for us. Uh, you know, we get our emotions. We're personally involved as well to be able to walk away, but it's so important to be able to negotiate that deal. You have to let them know you're prepared to walk away. Not saying that we quit on the house, but let people know you're prepared to walk away if necessary. Number three, we want to lock down the property with the strongest possible offer and even escalation clauses. So we've been training on this as well uh, in our boot camp, and we're going to probably do some more uh, on this. But you want to make sure once you find the property that the customer wants, that we're locking it in. So our job is securing the property that they want. So we want to make sure how do we lock down the property with the strongest possible offer? And this is an hey guys, shame. This is the market that we're in today. So because we're in such a strong market, we want to make sure that we're giving the strongest possible offers or it's very easy for the seller to kick us out and take the next one. So when the market shifts or something changes, the market changes, which happens all the time, you know, our strategies are going to change as well. But the market we're in today, we have to make sure that we're making the strongest possible offer. That's how we're going to secure that property. You want to choose your words carefully. So number four, you got to remember that we're in kind of a little bit of a chess match here. So you got to make sure that you're not showing too much of your hand. Um, you're not walking through the property and the customer going, oh my gosh, this is the dream house. This is the one I always wanted when the listing agent is there. Like, shh, <laughs> right? Be careful the words that you're saying. Choose your words carefully. We're trying to do a negotiation uh, to get the best deal for our client. Always handle negotiations in person or over the phone. So I think because of technology, we leverage technology a lot. So we're doing text messaging, we're sending emails to people. You don't want to do a lot of those strategy negotiation uh, parts of the deal, not over the phone. It's a very personal sale. It's very easy for someone to get their feelings hurt. Uh, text can have misunderstandings. At any point, I say this often to our team, if, you're, if your text message covers the whole screen, that's something that's a phone call, right? We don't need to be giving novels to people and and use showing our skills with our thumbs. Like, let's make sure we're picking up the phone. These are personal conversations we need to have, especially if you're trying to get something accomplished. If you're trying to negotiate and get something done, you need to do it or in person. So anytime I've had a, either a, a difficult client or a difficult phone call, I say, you know what, let's sit down and meet together. So why don't we do listing appointments over the phone? Because it's, it's a negotiation. We want to do those. You're going to be a lot stronger whenever you're going to be in person with somebody. Also, make sure you're listening carefully to the conversation at hand. 
sometimes I think we're not active listening. So somebody might say something and we're coming back with a certain response. You want to make sure that you're actively listening. Don't be thinking about what am I going to say next? You know, you get a little bit too much in your head. You're not actively listening to what is happening right now. So if the, let's say you're trying to negotiate a better price and you're trying to convince that listing agent that you are the strongest buyer, they need to take your offer. And she's telling you little clues of what's important to her seller. So she might say, well, because the last deal fell through or he's super concerned about the inspection because the inspection didn't come through uh, good the first time, make sure you're really listening. So when you hear those cues from me, I'm going, okay, so I now know the seller's pain points. Now I know the things that they're really concerned with, one of them being action not coming back correctly. So what if I came in with an offer, maybe my price is a little bit lower, but I have a two-day inspection period or I waive an inspection completely because you're actively listening to what people are saying. You're actually able to negotiate based on what those pain and pleasure points are. So make sure you're really, really listening. It's super important. Focus on the end result of what you're looking for. I talk about this a lot too. Do you even know what the goal is? When you're on the phone with someone, are you just talking to have a conversation or is your goal to get an appointment? Your goal is to get the appointment, no matter how the conversation goes, where it goes, I'm trying to negotiate the value of why I should get in their door. Why should I meet them at their house? I'm trying to give them lots of value. A lot of reason why we memorize unique selling propositions. Why should they meet me at all? You know, why don't they just stay where they are forever? Why don't they just rent out their home instead of selling it? Why don't they list it for sale by owner? There's lots of options for somebody. I'm trying to negotiate my value of why I need to get in the door because I know my end result is I want it. I want to set the appointment. That's the reason I'm on the phone. So focusing on that end result of where are we trying to go here? So if I go on a listing appointment, now that I'm in the door and I'm sitting there in front of somebody, what's my end goal here? I want them to sign my listing agreement. I want them to list their home with me. If I'm out showing houses, am I trying to sell that house to that buyer? No, I'm there to earn their business. I'm there to learn more about them. So I have my end goal in mind. Number eight, use timing as your friend. So you guys will see in all of your real estate contracts in all bold letters, it says time is of the essence of this contract. There's a reason for that. It really plays into with your negotiation skills as well. So use that as your friend. Sometimes timing can work against you. You ever had a deal where timing is not your friend? Probably often. So we want to make sure that we understand the value of timing. It's, it's pressure. So you can push for what you want, or you can take a deal off the table. My offer is only good for the next two hours. You guys ever watch any of the negotiation skills on uh, real estate shows? They do that kind of stuff. There's a purpose for that. So when you're trying to negotiate something that you want, use timing as your friend. So it can work as your enemy if you let somebody look at a house that they love and then they want to sleep on it. Oh no. By the next day, they've changed their mind. <laughs> By the next day, they found another house that they want. By the next day, their friend told them not to buy because the market's too hot right now. So it can definitely work against you. Make sure you're using timing as your friend. Use that for negotiation as well. All right, so let's look back. Let's, let's scoot back a little bit and look at the big picture here. What is the purpose of the listing agent? So if you guys are out showing houses to buyers, I want you to know who is your opponent. And I say this lightly in a, a loving, caring way, but if we're working on negotiating, you want to know who am I working against? Who is my, my chess match partner here? So a listing agent's role is they want to convince the seller of what their home is actually worth in today's market. That's a tough job. That takes negotiation skills, right? So the listing agent has fought to get the listing has fought to get the price that wherever they're listed at right now in the market. And their job was convincing that seller of what their home is worth. So imagine if you come out now as the buyer agent and you're saying, okay, I know you listed at 350. I have a buyer that's willing to pay 300. That is also uncomfortable for the listing agent, right? They have to now go back and tell their seller, I told you your house is worth 350, but I have an offer at 300. So it's already uncomfortable. You're putting them in an uncomfortable situation. So if we don't understand and relate where they're coming from, we think, wow, they're such a jerk. I, I'm giving them a bona fide offer 300. They should take it. Why are they being a jerk? Because this is putting them in an uncomfortable situation. They now have to go back and renegotiate a deal they've already negotiated. Another mistake I've heard, uh, I had a friend of mine, she's a real estate agent. So she was trying to buy her own house and kept trying to negotiate her commission into the deal. Like I'll waive my commission or only take 1% commission. And I'm like, stop doing that because what you're doing is you're putting the listing agent in an uncomfortable position. 
If you're trying to get something done, you're trying to get something accomplished, don't put your opponent in a difficult situation. Let's make it as easy as possible for the listing agent. Let them know that we are the best solution. We have the best buyer. Our team is the strongest team. We sell hundreds of homes. Our lender is the best. Our title attorney is the best. We want to put them in a very easy, smooth transaction because then they're more likely to want to do business with you. So we have to know where is that listing agent coming from? So their job, number one, they're going to convince the seller where to list their home. Number two, they're going to convince them that they're going to get the highest price possible from the buyer. That's their job. So that's what they've told their seller. In order to earn their seller's business, the listing agent has told them, I will get you the highest price possible and we're going to go under contract. And then their job is to walk them through the process to get the home closed. So if those are their three jobs as a listing agent, if we're the buyer agent trying to get a deal done, why don't we try to make that process as smooth as possible for the list so that they're more interested in, in working with you? Why should they take your offer? We're in a hot market. Listing agent, they kind of hold all the cards right now because if you don't come to the table with a good price, what are they going to do? No problem. I'll get the next one, right? They're just going to sit back and wait for the next buyer. So if this is their purpose, this is the listing agent's agenda, this is where their brain is, where they're focused on, let's make the process easy for them. We know what our opponent is dealing with. So now if you're the buyer's agent, what's your purpose? What's your end result? What's your goal? Number one, you're trying to get your buyers to the correct price that's going to be accepted by the seller of the home they want. Again, this is in today's market. As the market changes, all of our strategies are going to change as well. But in today's market, your job is to get the buyers to come up to an accepted price. How do we know it's the accepted price? We call the listing agent and we ask them, what's the price that my buyer needs to do, needs to come up with today to get it off the market? So they're going to be asking those questions because we want to make sure our number one job is to get the house accepted. Because if I'm a buyer's agent and my job, if I had a customer call me and wants me to help them find a house, and then once you find the house they want, they want to put it under contract, that's your job. You want to do whatever it's going to take, whatever negotiation is necessary to make sure that you get the correct price from your buyer so that the seller accepts your offer. And then number two job is, of course, we're walking them through the process of purchasing the home that fits their needs. So those are your two agendas. So if you're working as a listing agent, you heard what your agendas were. As a buyer's agent, you know what your agenda is. So now how do we bridge the gap and put a deal together? Because we almost have a little bit of opposing views. The listing agent's job is to get the highest price for the property. The buyer's agent's job is to try to get the least amount of price for the property, right? And then we're the middle people trying to coordinate between the other agent to make a deal happen. This is why negotiation is so important and so valuable. How does the deal get done, right? Now I'm working through an agent to try to get the right price, to try to put the right terms, to have this be a smooth process for everyone involved. That's our job. So we have to really communicate with skill to that listing agent. We're trying to put this deal together. We want a deal that the buyer and seller will agree to. So, you know, I'm not the buyer writing the check and I'm not the seller selling my home and moving. So I can't, I can't be in their, in their place. I have to work my job, which is getting that deal together somewhere in the middle to make everyone happy, make the buyer happy, make the seller happy in a win-win scenario so that the deal gets done. The hardest part is that we're working through somebody else to make those things happen. So if you guys have ever worked with an agent on the other end of the deal, that's making your, your life very difficult. I know I have. So when you're working through someone, you have to know how do I speak to this person to get the message heard, to get the message delivered to their customer. Sometimes I feel like they're in the way. If only I could talk directly to the seller, I know I could make this deal happen. But in most situations, we can't do that. So you gotta make sure that we're communicating properly to the listing agent, finding out what they want, finding out their motivation, finding out their disc personality so that we're communicating properly and negotiating properly to get the deal done. You guys like that? We want to close more deals, right? So always focus on making it a win-win. That's going to be the number one priority in any negotiation. Now, sometimes people like to, you know, bully someone down and get the lowest price. And that's not what we do here, right? We want to make sure that we're, we want a five-star experience we want customers to use us again, refer us business. We want to make friends with the other agent. Maybe we can recruit them to our team or a downline. That's only going to happen through a win-win situation. So the most skillful negotiators are those that create win-win scenarios for both parties in the equation. As an amateur agent myself, 
I always wanted the win for the customer. Whoever I was representing, I felt like I had to get some sort of win. So I was going to try to throw in the washer and the dryer and get the lowest price and have them also cover closing costs and get the home warranty. Like that was super important to me as an amateur agent. You know what happened a lot of times? The seller had lots of seller's remorse. And I'm going, ha ha, you're in the contract already. You already said yes. You know, I felt like that was my job. Well, I can tell you from experience that doesn't work very well. That whole 30 days under contract was not a pleasant experience because the seller had major, major seller's remorse. They wanted the deal to fall apart. If the deal fell apart, they would go get a better contract from another buyer. So they were doing everything they could to not make this a smooth process. Hey, we have a couple, we have a couple changes um, from the repair request from the inspection report. Are they going to do those things? Nope. We're not doing anything. Okay, uh, that makes things difficult. I had someone, when they left, they, they took the uh, washer and dryer and dragged it across the hardwood floor on their way out. I had people that, that tore up plants when they left. So that when someone pulled up, they go, oh my gosh, like the house looks terrible. This isn't the same house that I thought I was buying. Someone who didn't maintain the pool, the pool was green when they go to move into their new home. So we don't want to get these big wins for our buyers that's now putting our sellers where they're not very happy with us right? They're going to do whatever they can to not make this a smooth experience. Plus, they're probably going to remember you and your name and tell people not to use you. And you go, but I was doing the best job for my buyer. That is not the business that we're in, guys. It's too personal. It's an emotional sale. So we want to make sure we're making it win-win for buyers, win-win for sellers. Because just because you're trying to score the deal does not mean that there's nothing in it for the seller. We want both parties to get a win and feel good about it and shake hands at the closing table and cry and give each other a hug and be super happy about the experience they had. So the next key to successful negotiating is compromise. So I say this often when I'm giving you guys some support on a deal that's kind of getting a little, a little wonky here. So we want to make sure that we're trying to create win-win scenarios and we're looking for areas that people are willing to budge within the contract. So you have your your buyer now has this inspection report. There's all these things wrong. They want to go back to the table, renegotiate. The seller's going, no way. I already gave you a 10,000 off the price. I'm already giving you 3% back in closing costs. I'm not touching this house. I'm not spending another dollar on this home. You're going, oh, great. Okay, so I have two clients that have drawn a line in the sand. I'm not going any further and neither am I. Great, what do we do? We're going to try to make some sort of compromise. So use that word a lot too. I don't want people to think that they're being taken advantage of. Some buyers go, oh, now they won't even do repairs. Now I'm being taken advantage of. Nope. Your job is to communicate. This is just a compromise, right? We're going to make this work. We still want the house. So just because we're not going to have the, uh, the leaky sink that might cost a hundred bucks to replace uh, fix doesn't mean that the house is not still a good deal. Let's, let's make a compromise here because we got the 3% back in closing costs. You know, let's call that a win. 3% back. We just got 20,000 from the seller. We also don't need to get the leaky, leaky sink fixed, right? So you got to make sure that we're, we're thinking on the terms of compromise and you have to be the one that's generating this idea of compromise for people. Sometimes once they've made their line in the sand or once it's gotten emotional or once they're trying to, you know, push their side one or the other, sometimes it's gone a little too far. You have to bring everyone back to the table again, because the worst thing is for people to throw up their hands, get pissed off and then back out. The language that you use is so important. And this is why you have to pick up the phone. This is why you can't text your way out of a repair request. You can't email your way out of someone who's mad. So you have to make sure that you're using your voice, using your phone and using affirmative language. Usually we say the strongest person, the most convinced person wins is most influential. That's really, really important. So the best negotiators are very decisive and direct. Christine has done a great job of talking about her, the stuff she's learned with Grant Cardone and just being very specific. Like a customer goes, but I don't know if this is the right one. You have to come back and say, but this is the right one. We've looked at 20 other houses. We've looked all over. You and I have been working together for three months. You, you looked the internet eight months before you met me. Like this is the right house. It's in the right price point. It's going to give you the yard that you need for your family. It's in, you know, they've taken the 3% off the closing costs, like whatever that situation is. If you're very decisive and direct with them, it helps them make better decisions. Sometimes we get stuck in our head and we need good advice. You guys ever been in a situation that you were thinking one way, someone comes in and goes, well, maybe that's not what they meant, Jen. And I go, oh yeah, you're right. I'm all stuck in my head. I needed a friend's advice. Kind of look at yourself as we're giving friendly advice to our customers because we know what they want and using very, very direct language. Negotiation room is not the place to change your mind or doubt yourself. 
So if you're ever starting to doubt, like maybe they shouldn't buy this house. Maybe this isn't the right place for them. You're doubting. You're definitely creating that doubt for the customer. So make sure that you're using that affirmative language. Be decisive. Know what the best outcome is for your client. Be influential to get your purpose across and next steps. So you don't want to say, well, I don't know, maybe. I don't like whenever I, I've, I've heard like, oh, well, they found the house they wanted, but just in case we went ahead and showed them four others. What? That's not being very decisive. You're creating doubt. Now they're like, well, I don't know about that one because now that I saw house number three, it kind of has a better pool. Like we want to be very decisive. We know what they're looking for. Give them the freedom to say, we don't need to look at any more houses. When you find the right house, we're going to write an offer at the kitchen table. You don't need to look at any more houses and show them next steps. So anytime that we're on the phone, our goal is that we want to get in front of them. We're trying to set the appointment. Anytime we're in the appointment, we're trying to get hired for the job. Either they're signing a listing agreement or a buyer's contract with us. We're trying to get hired for the job. The next time that we're showing houses, we're trying to get them to write offers. We know what the next step is. We don't want the customer to go, go crazy and say, well, now we're going to maybe go look at Destin too. We, we're also thinking about moving to Georgia. Like there's all these options in the world today. They're looking for wisdom. And that's why they hire real estate professionals like you, right? So we want to make sure that we know what the best outcome is and make decisions. Know your path, help the client get out of their own way and take the next logical step to get closer to purchasing their home. So this is the next step. We're walking them through the process and that's our job as the buyer agent or the listing agent, making this very easy and simple for them. But you have to give them that path. Don't assume they know what to do next. So some, some clients are maybe a high S or a high C are worried about a lot of things. They're, I'm, I'm trying to write an offer in a property and they're going, what about the appraisal? What if it doesn't appraise? Like that's later. That's not right now. So step number two that we're on, customer, we're right here. We just want to get the home off the market. Our job right now is to get the house. You found the house you want. My job is to secure the house that you want. We'll worry about the appraisal step when we get there, if we get there. You know, we're kind of, we're jumping ahead. Or I have some customers that think that they can just look at hundreds of homes. They don't want to get pre-approved yet. So we know what the process is. We want to make sure that we're walking them through our five-step millionaire process and letting them know what's next. Don't let them run away with their uh, imaginations there. And then I, I know I'm talking about this a lot today, but I think this is a huge missed opportunity. When people start ghosting us, when people don't return our phone calls, when all of a sudden we don't know what happened to them, I can almost guarantee it's because you've not talked to them on the phone. You don't have a relationship. You know how easy it is to ghost someone that you don't care about or don't know? It's really easy. Once you're invested in someone and they do care about you and they know who you are and they're, now they're going to feel really guilty for ghosting you. Okay. So, and anytime there's a moment of tension, let's say you put an offer in a house that doesn't get accepted. That's a huge moment of tension. Am I going to text them? Sorry, guys, lost this one too. Oof. That's the amateur agent who does that. The experienced skilled realtor is going to pick up the phone and just say, man, I'm so sorry. I know that you really like this house. And unfortunately they got a better offer. I, you know, I wish we could have came up, but I know we're at the max of your budget. I'm so sorry, but don't worry. I found another house that you're going to love. I found the next property. So are you available later today? Let's go look at one, two, three main street. Because I care about that person. I'm investing in them and I want to have a relationship. I need to talk to them over the phone. Really bad news. Let's say I had a listing and the, the buyer fell in. They weren't qualified anymore and we lost the contract. I might go to their house in person. You know what, guys? Uh, let, if you're available, maybe when you get off work tonight, maybe I can swing by really quickly. I want to give you an update what's going on. It's important. It's a relationship. Make sure that we're talking over, over the phone. It's very easy to misunderstand right? what you're saying, misinterpret things. And it's very easy for your client to overreact and get emotional where they're not going to act that way in person to you. Have you ever sent a na nasty text or a nasty email? And then you had to face that person. And you're like, oof, like I wouldn't have said that to you face to face, but sending a text was pretty easy to do. So you're inviting that kind of behavior when you're texting them first, rather than trying to build a relationship. So it's all about letting them know you have their back. They're our customer. I'm here for you. I work for you. You hired me. Like my income is based on you having satisfaction and wanting to work with me. You hired me. Like, let's not forget our customer service here. So let them know we have their back. We're on their side. No matter what the situation is happening, we always want to stay in agreement. Always, always, always agree. I'm here to work for you. I'm here to help you through this process. So something happens, something comes up, the buyer fell out of escrow, the, 
buyer changed their mind. I mean, all these things we know happen. Please talk to them over the phone and be in relationship with them. Be there for them like a friend would be because this is emotional and it is really hard when you lose the property. When you're mentally invested going, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I can see my couch in that living room. I can see my kids going to school in the school district I really wanted. I can see the big backyard that I've never had before. I've always wanted for my dog. It's emotional. We're invested in properties and now we lose it. So if you're not in relationship with these people and helping them through the bad news too, I know we're disappointed. Like, darn it. We thought we had a closing date coming up in two weeks. Now we lost it. Like we're also disappointed. And you can share that. You can let them know I'm disappointed also. Like that's a good way of being in agreement with people. But you have to make sure that we're there for them or they won't use us for the next house. They're going to blame you. So if you go, sorry, oops, lost it, too bad. They're going to go, you know what? Maybe this is you, Jen. If I hired that, if I had hired my friend as an agent, I bet you I could have got the house I wanted. So it's super, super important relational. They'll, they'll go and buy the next house from somebody else after you've invested lots of time in them. So let's say that we've, we've got the deal. All right. We earned the contract. We went over the listing agent. We went over the seller. Our buyer is the best buyer possible. We told the buyer what price to put in. How do we keep this deal together now? This is another huge negotiation step, right? Number one, make sure you're listening before reacting. I am guilty of this myself. I get super disappointed because I'm numbers orientated. I'm goal orientated. I'm like, I got my five contracts for the month and something fell through. Darn it. So I react, right? This is going to naturally happen. Always check your ego at the door because it's not about us. It feels like it. It feels personal. Hey, that sale was my sale, right? I'm very invested in this, but it's not about you. So if we go into something saying, Mr. Buyer, Mr. Seller, I'm here for you. Well, then how am I going to get my feelings hurt and get emotional and react over something that's not about me? It's about them. So that's super important. So it can easily get emotional between any party, including you. And one party is very likely to just throw up their hands and walk away because it gets emotional. So I try to get ahead of it before emotions flare, before someone's going to get mad. If I have to deliver bad news, I'm ahead of it because I don't want them to say, forget it, right? Cancel the contract. I'm out of here. This seller's ridiculous. And they get ticked off. You also want to give others a chance to respond fully before coming up with a counter or moving on. This is huge. So let's say that we go, we'll stick with the inspections because I feel like that's an, an important uh, part right now in, in our businesses. Um, so let's say the inspection period. So the inspection report comes back. It's got 15 things on it, right? And your, sell, your buyer wants you to fix all of them. How are we going to handle that? How are we going to go through and rationalize with the buyer to get just the things done that need to be done without pissing off your seller, having your seller throw their hands up and walking away? So I give them a chance to talk, let them talk it through. We're going to have a discussion. You never want to be the messenger, right? Everyone knows people shoot the messengers. We're not messengers. We're skilled negotiators. So I'm going to listen to my buyer and I'm going to give them a couple of different options. I'm going to give them good advice. Then we're going to come up with a good solution together. Then I'm going to go present it to my seller. So don't just go be the back and forth person, but he said this. So she said this, blah, blah, blah. No, then you have no purpose. You're just a messenger. You want to make sure that we're really putting together counter offers as a team. We're telling them what they should say, what they should do, and then we're relaying the message properly. Focus on the outcome. I know I mentioned this already, but what's so important is you always want to not lose sight of what's the end goal. What, what am I trying to accomplish here? Where am I trying to go? It's very easy to get distracted, right? There's lots of tangents out there. I'm guilty of that myself. So remember that we're there to get the property for the customer. So no matter if the listing agent's giving you crap about the commissions and well, if you, if you take off some of your money, then, you know, we can make the deal happen. Like there's all these tangents, emotional things that are trying to derail the deal. Stay focused on what we're trying to do here. Don't get emotionally wrapped into it yourself. Say, okay, whatever. We're going to get over this. We're going to work through this and we're going to make sure that our deal still closes. We're going to keep the deal together. Stay on task during your meeting. So again, same kind of thing. Don't let yourself get distracted all over the place. Just make sure that you're staying on task. What's my goal of sitting down with my customer today? I'm going to try to get them to go from 25 items on the inspection report to three. So no matter what happens or what they say, I'm going to always go back to what is my goal? Why am I here? And really staying on, staying on task. Oh, so why would a customer listen to you? So you're trying to give them advice. They, if they have no relationship, no rapport built with you and no trust built with you, why would they listen? 
So you'll, whenever you guys start to see somebody's talking to a family member, they're getting advice from other sources and they come to you and say, well, my mom said this because they don't trust you. So we think it's them, right? We think, oh, there must be something wrong with them. They're an idiot. They're stupid. The truth is you haven't earned their trust. It always comes right back to, do you have credibility or not? Why should they trust you? So trust seems like it's a light word, but it's not. This is how you have influence over people. If you're trying to negotiate a deal and they don't trust you, they don't, it doesn't matter the words that you use. Like no matter what they say, someone who wants a liar, always a liar, right? Once a cheater, always a cheater. So trust is earned. So number one, never lie. <laughs> so sometimes we get put in a little box or stuck in the corner. We feel a little trapped and we think, oh, if I just lie my way out of this, you might have bad habits. Maybe that's how you were raised. Maybe that's how you grew up. Maybe that's how you got out of situations in the past. I don't know. In this professional real estate climate, just never lie. So I've had somebody say, oh, well, I can't get into the property right now, right? Like, meanwhile, I'm, I'm having my hair appointment that day. So I tell the customer, I can't get in. I'm going to blame it on the seller or listing agent. So then they go, hmm, okay, no problem. And then they call the listing agent themselves and they get in. Are they ever going to do business with you? Are they ever going to trust a word that comes out of your mouth now that you lied about something as simple as I can't get in because the seller said no, and that's a lie, right? So stay away from that because if you, once you burn trust, you, it's really, really hard to get it back. So that's, that's number one. If you don't know the answer, find out the answer from a credible source. So if they're trusting you with this big decision, and meanwhile, they say, well, what does flood zone X mean? And you're not sure. Don't say, um, I think that's fine. You don't need flood insurance but you really don't know. So the minute they find out they did need flood insurance, are they ever gonna trust your decisions again? This is why customers ghost you. This is why customers won't sign your VIP buyer agreement. This is why they decide to list their house with somebody else. You never earned their trust. It always comes down to this. When I say we're in the people business, this is why I say this. It's not about transaction real estate and writing contracts. It is about people. So you really have to learn if you want to be influential, if you want people to listen to you, if you want buyers to write the offer you suggest, you want sellers to list their house where you suggest, trust is number one. Um, so if you don't know the answer, find out. Just say, let me find out for you. Two seconds. This is why we have partners, why we vetted these people out. Why do I spend so much time vetting out partners? I'm not in the, why do I need to know the best home inspector? Why, why does it matter if I have a title attorney or if I use whoever the customer wants? because I want credible sources because that means they trust me. If I give them bad advice from someone I recommended, do they trust me anymore? Or do I just lose trust because of a partnership, because of someone I referred? So there's leverage and trust. So number one, just always do the right thing. It sounds like something you don't need to train on, but I know it gets emotional sometimes. You want a deal to happen. So you're trying to push it so hard that you end up kind of doing things that maybe you wouldn't do if that was your mom or your brother or your sister. So if you always do the right thing, when you earn people's trust, even if it's something goes wrong and you had their back, the seller really did lie on something. They did not disclose something. There's ter active termites that they knew about, active leak that they knew about. And you're the one that's coming to them saying, oh my gosh, you won't believe this. I'm so sorry. But we found out, you know, the seller was dishonest with something. So I don't think this is the right house for you. I think let's find you something else. You know, if they lied about that, maybe they lied about something else. So even delivering that bad news, now they trust you. Are they ever going to use another agent? Are they going to go, well, Jen found me the house. She even told me reasons not to buy a house. That's a way to earn trust. Don't act like it's the last deal you were due together. So sometimes they kind of have that feeling like, oh, we close in two weeks. Bye. Block your number after we close. Right? That's not a way to earn people's trust. So if I'm always talking about long-term relationships, that I want a five-star review from you, that I want you to refer your friends and family with me. If you ever decide to sell this house or you decide you hate the house, we do a 12-month money-back guarantee. The reason we do all this is we never want to act like this is it. Because if this is the only time that we're going to see each other, then maybe you will act a little dishonest. Maybe you're not that trustworthy. But if I'm trying to build a career in real estate and I want to do business with you again in the future, it's showing that I'm looking more than just this, this one transaction. I'm looking long-term. I'm going to take care of that person because I want them to come back and use me again because I'm trying to build my reputation and build a brand. It's not a one-time transaction. Save the relationship over the contract. So as much as I push to not let deals fall through, we want to push as hard as we can to keep the deal together. If the deal cannot be put together 
or maybe like I said, the seller was dishonest about the roof leaking, something like that. You know what? The relationship's more important over the deal. So let's make sure we're taking care of people. We're looking long term. If you save save the uh, con save the customer, not the contract. Okay, don't ever accept blame or apologize. <laughs> So this is a huge one. Just to give you an example, I have a, a seller right now that was getting pre-approved through a bank to buy a second home in North Carolina and something fell through and he's telling me the story and I'm just, you know, listening as a third party about how she continued to accept the blame. He goes, I have emails and text messages and voicemails of her apologizing to me. And how is he using those apologies? He's now going to hire an attorney and use all the things that she said in writing about it being her fault and apologizing to get his $10,000 escrow back. So he's gathering data from the customer who she thinks she's giving great service by apologizing and trying to make things right and saying, oh, I should have known and I didn't do this and I should have done that and I didn't, it's my fault. He's using that for his next lawsuit. So I'm listening to it and it's just a reminder to me again, I'm never apologizing like, oh my gosh, I dropped the ball. You're right. The inspection period was seven days. It was yesterday. I missed it. The minute that you do that, you're taking liability. Not only are you taking blame, you're taking liability. So I never, ever take blame like that. So if something goes wrong in the transaction, I make sure I'm very clear that I did all I could. That when they sign a contract, they're required to read it as well. So never tell a customer, oh, don't read it. It's just, you know, just sign it, just sign it, just sign it. Because the minute something goes wrong, they're going to go, well, Jen told me just to sign it. I keep responsibility where responsibility needs to be. This is your responsibility as an adult, if you're signing a contract, to read it and you abide by the terms. I'm here to help and advise, but it, at the end of the day, it's your money, it's your decisions. It's your responsibility. I keep responsibility where it's owed. Don't take it on yourself. Hope that makes sense, guys. All right, so we're under contract. Now let's get into a little bit of those negotiations. We have inspections being done and repairs being requested. So how does this work? So the inspection report comes back with seven items, very clear saying they are, these things are wrong and the home inspector recommends that they get these taken care of before they move in. Thanks, Mr. Home Inspector, appreciate your help there. So we're gonna talk through with the buyer, what are the most important items? So don't assume, I've made this mistake many times where I see, I've seen so many reports like, okay, well, most likely he's gonna be mad about the roof. He's gonna be mad about the toilet. He's gonna be mad about this. I'm assuming the things he's gonna want done. That's not my job. My job is to say, what makes the buyer comfortable? Don't get, you're not moving in the house. It's not about your opinion. It's not about you. It's about them. So I'm going to talk through what are the most important items and what is the deal breaker for you? I've had customers look at it and they go, really, Jen, none of these are deal breakers. So why would we ask for repairs when none of them have any influence over the contract? So if they say there are no deal breakers, sometimes we feel like it's our job, but, but my, my checklist item here is that I'm supposed to negotiate repairs, not your job. Your job is to secure them the house that they want. So don't create problems that don't exist. So what is the most important items on here? You're already letting them know that the seller's not going to fix everything. The house is not going to be perfect. I've had new construction homes that still have issues, right? But you can live in a home that has a, you know, a, uh, what are they, the polarity is off when I try to plug in my laptop in one of the outlets. It doesn't stop you from living in the home. The garbage disposal needs replaced. That has nothing to do with the home. So don't get stuck in the weeds, stuck in these little details. The only thing I want to know for my buyers, what is your deal breakers? And I say that. If there's, so let's say there's seven items and I'll go over what's the three top must haves. And I'm going to discuss it with the listing agent first. Don't get ahead of yourself and say, okay, what are the items you want? All right, Jordan, will you go draft an, uh, an addendum and email it over to the customer to sign? I want to have a conversation first because am I setting up my buyer for failure or success? So if I assume that those three things the seller is going to do, no problem. And I have the buyer sign the addendum. I email it over. The buyer thinks that they got it. They think like, okay, yeah, they agreed, right? Once I sign my name to a document, I really feel like that's the truth now. It's in writing. It's done. The seller is going to fix those things. What if the seller says no? Now you've put yourself in a little bit of a situation there. <laughs> so I will call the listing agent first. Once I've narrowed down the seven to three, or hopefully less, maybe one, um, narrowed the things down, I'm going to say, hey, we just got the, re the report request back. And usually I make it sound a little worse than it is, right? Because that's my job. I'm negotiating. 
So I'm going to say there's lots of things on here that need fixed. Of course, a listing agent's going to say, what? Everything's perfect in the house. What do you mean? It's pretty much brand new, right? Because that's their job in the negotiation. So I'm going to come back and say, well, we noticed that the garbage disposal doesn't work. Um, the There's a, uh, I don't know, the drain in the tub is stopped up. We really want that fixed. And we want you to paint over somewhere on the wall that has a crack. Like these are must-haves for our buyer. Absolutely, these are the three things. Will your seller complete those things for us? Do you think we're in agreement? And I want to get a verbal agreement first. She knows her customer. So she goes, absolutely not. He is crazy. This guy is a total jerk. I hate even having to call him. I cringe when his phone number comes up on my phone. He won't do a thing. Then I better set up my buyer for that, for success. Let them know. I just talked to a listing agent. It seems like, you know, the buyer's already, our seller's already moved out. He's not going to be able to take care of these things. I'm so sorry. You know, is it still, is it a deal breaker for you? Most of the time they say no. No. Okay, fine. He won't do them. I figured I'd ask roll the dice. Why not? He said, no, no problem. Actually, my husband's very handy. I could do it myself. So you'll start to learn that there's difference between like to haves and must haves, huge difference there. So once you get your verbal agreement, then you type up that repair addendum. So don't get ahead of yourself typing it up before you even know if they're going to say yes, they don't, there's not, it's not required that they do your repairs. So let's do a couple of role play scenarios. Situation number one, the buyer wants all the things from the report. So maybe you've had this before. The buyer's not very realistic. And this is where I'm using the words like compromise often. <laughs> well, where can we compromise? Where can we be flexible? Because they're not budging at all, right? So I'm trying to work this through with my buyer. Let's say they want all 12 things and they're not budging. So the first thing I'll do is I'm going to try to talk them out of that. Let them know. Let's try to make a compromise. If they absolutely won't, then I'm going to call the listing agent. I'm not going to, I'm not going to promise anything to my buyer because I don't know what the seller is willing to do. I've never met them. I don't know them. So I'm going to discuss and say, okay, all these things are wrong with the house. So my job is to convince her that the buyer might walk. I have to convince her of that. So if they don't want that. They don't want the buyer to cancel and walk. They want to make it work. So she's going to immediately go into compromise mode. What can we do, Jen? Don't let them walk. I'm going to say, well, there is so many things on there. He will not believe it. I have 12 different items. The buyer is not very handy. He doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the money, can't do it himself. He absolutely needs this done before he can move in. I'm going to try to sell it to her. So her and I need to come up with a solution together. Okay, listing agent. So I know there's something wrong with the, whole, the water heater. They're not willing to, re to replace it. You know, it's by a $5,000 replacement, but what about a $500 home warranty instead? Okay, yeah, I think he would do that. Okay, great. Um, what about these couple of small items here? You think you have a handyman or someone? I maybe have a handyman. Let's send them over. They're going to save them a little money from like a licensed professional. Yes. So we're compromising. I'm working out this deal with the listing agent. How do I get my buyer what they want without ticking off the seller and also helping the seller get what they want? I'm working again in a win-win relationship. Let's try to work this out. And I'm here as the problem solver. Me and the listing agent, we both want this to stay together. We want the deal to close, right? We want to move on to other contracts. We want to make something work. So we're both motivated, should be anyway, highly motivated to make the deal work. So we're going to come up with some sort of solution. We're going to find a happy medium with the listing agent. And then we're going to go back and present that to our buyer. Okay, Mr. Buyer, I know you wanted all the 12 things. Here's what we're willing to do. They won't replace the, home, the water heater, but we're going to get a home warranty. It's going to be good for 13 months. So let's sell that to them on why that's a great deal. They're willing to do these four items. They're going to have a handyman go over. They can handle these, no problem. They'll give us receipts. They're going to send us pictures, show us that the work has been completed. Okay, great, right? And maybe there's one or two things that they won't do, but you know what? They did agree to all 10, 10 items. They don't have to do anything and they agreed to 10. So that's a win. I'm going to convince my buyer that that's a win. We got a win, right? Here's another scenario. Let's say the listing agent is not willing to make any repairs at all. Because so who's our, it's usually you're trying to work with a difficult client on one side or the other, and we're trying to make it work and close the gap. So I want to first have a discussion with my buyer and let them know, you know, are, are they willing to walk away? Are these deal breakers for them? Don't get ahead of yourself and assume they are. So just because the seller said they're not going to do anything, you're thinking, oh no, I got to call the buyer back. He's going to be upset. He's going to walk from the deal. We don't know that, right? Let's just find out. So before we create a problem, let's, let's walk it through. So I'm going to reach out to the buyer and I'm going to say, Hey, you know, the seller is not capable, able, financially ready, lives out of state for whatever reason, they're just not able to do these repairs. So are you willing to walk away based on, you know, a leaky water heater? 
or whatever the situation is and help them make that decision. If they're, if it's an absolute, like, no, cause I'm, I'm 80 years old and I can't make the repairs. Okay. That makes sense. I have no money. I can't do repairs on my own. Okay. That makes sense. But when you're purchasing a home, you are taking responsibility for that home. So most people that want to buy the home itself, they're spending $400,000. I don't think a hundred dollar issue is going to keep them from a $400,000 home. That's silly. So our job really is let's try to keep the deal together. We can suggest a handyman. Hey, I have a guy. He can come over after closing. Probably not a big deal. We can estimate what the repair costs are. Show them how small they are. Sometimes getting emotional in your head. They think this is a huge deal. Say, well, actually you can get a new garbage disposal for a hundred bucks. Is that worth losing your house? That's kind of seems silly to me. If you're minimizing the problems, making them smaller, problem solving, working them through, all of a sudden to the buyer, they seem smaller too, because we're influential. Remind them of their pain points. So I've had people say, forget it, we're walking from the deal. Remind them again. Say, okay, are you just going to keep renting? Because we can, you know, you told me you're spending 3000 a month in rent. We really want to get, that's why we're looking to purchase a home. Remind them again of why they're in this business. Why, why are you even at the point that you're at right now? Go back to what's their motivation and timing. Say, okay, we can cancel this one. If you want to cancel because the inspections, I get it. We can start looking again, but just know it's going to take us the next two to three weeks to look, another 30 to 45 days under contract. And you said that you wanted your kids to be in before school starts. I mean, that's pretty soon because we're a friend giving them advice. They're getting emotional and you're going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, no problem. But remember why we're here. Remember why we did this to begin with. Remember why you picked out this house. Remember all the other homes that we saw that did not match what you wanted. So that's your job as their friend is to remind them when they get emotional. If they cannot keep the deal together, of course, keep the relationship, contract, cancel the contract within their inspection period. We don't want them to lose money. And within 24 hours, you need to have showing set up for their next home. There's lots of times as an amateur agent that I would say, dart it. I'm disappointed. They're disappointed. Deal fell through. And we don't talk for two weeks. They buy with somebody else, right? Because they still have a need. They still want to buy a house, but I got discouraged and I don't even want to talk to them right now. And I'm mad because they canceled a deal that we should have kept together, in my opinion, but it's not about me. So within 24 hours, we want to find them a backup property right away. It's why they still like you, why they still trust you. Otherwise they'll blame you for the reason that they lost the house. Last one, guys. Number three, another different scenario. Let's say the buyer's not going to budge on five out of seven big repairs. Five to seven. They're like, nope, these are all very important to me. I got the listing agent to agree to three to five. So now it's like, okay, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to negotiate this deal? So when I'm speaking with the listing agent, it's a game of chess, like I said. When I'm speaking with them, I'm going to try to get as much as possible because I'm trying to get a win for my buyer. I work for my buyer. I want to get them a win. When I'm speaking with the buyer, I'm going to try to convince them that the three repairs is a good thing. So you're playing a chess match between two people. You're letting the listing agent know, oh, the sky is falling. Things are bad. You got to fix it or we're walking. You're letting the buyer know, actually, they're willing to do these three things out of seven. I think that's pretty good. That's a win. To get these other things might cost you a hundred bucks. Or I have a handyman I can refer. Or just replace the, the whatever, get a home warranty for 500 bucks. So we're trying to work it through both playing both sides a little bit, try to get as much as you can on one side and trying to convince the person that what they got is good. So we're trying to make a win-win situation where everyone feels like they got something. You don't want anyone to feel they were taken advantage of. So I think those are kind of the three scenarios that you guys probably see the most. And again, during a negotiation, it would be wise not to take anything personally. If you leave personalities out of it, you'll be able to see opportunities more objectively. So this is one of the top agents from uh, EXP that I really, really like that he said, because it's so true that we end up getting our own emotions involved. It's emotional already between buyer seller. We got to keep ourselves out of it. Then we can see it for what it is. So that's going to be a really huge strategy for you guys. So I hope that was helpful. I appreciate you guys hopping on. Again, we are in the sales business and we're in the negotiation business. We have to get good at these things. So I'm going to share this on our uh, Slack channel. You guys are welcome to go back through it again. Just some really hot tips of how to make every deal happen, make every deal work and where everyone feels good at the end of the day. Let's see. Thank Great you stuff. So much.